We made this. Hello and welcome to Geek Polymath, the podcast about casual and avid fandom here on the We Made This Podcast Network. My name is Mark and I am the Geek Polymath. I am into lots of things, but I'm not an expert in any of them. With me at this time is Baz Greenland. Hello, Baz. Hello, good to be here. So, Baz, tell everyone what we're talking about today. So, we're going for a geeky and we're talking about Doctor Who, the show which uh, means a lot to me and my life in general. It means a lot to me as well. I would say if I had to pick the area of polymathness, that's not a word, but if I had to pick the fandom that I have the most knowledge about, it probably would be Doctor Who. It's, it's been something I've been into for a very long time mm. as well, but we'll get that, into that in a little bit. Do you want to tell me who you are, what you do on the We Made This Podcast Network and what you do that makes you interesting? Right. Okay. So interesting. Okay. Right. So um, on We Made This, yeah, I'm involved like yourself on uh, far too many podcasts. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm a big, big geek. So um, I've actually got a Star Trek Connection podcast, Beyond Farpoint, on another network. And then on We Made This, I've got a Babylon 5 podcast, a Dream Game Reform. Uh, I've got a new Lord of the Rings podcast, One Rules Them All, on We Made This, I guess on many podcasts, and also I run, which ties nice to this, the TARDIS crew. So that's a Doc 2 podcast on the We Made This network, which I co-host with my son Ben, who is actually a much bigger Doc 2 geek than I am. I did think about having you both on at the same time, but because I'm so new to this particular podcast, I was like, that might be a bit chaotic, <laughs> and I might get confused. And um, I do think that... You were almost an easy win in as much as you're the Doctor Who podcast guy on the network. So, hello, Baz. Do you want to come on this? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's good. It's, <laughs> honestly, it, it, it's great to talk about it. I, I always love talking about Doctor Who. It's, um, it, as I say, it means a lot to me because I, I love the show. I've been a fan for quite a while now. I, I talk about it on a regular basis. I also write Doctor Who. So, I actually write for Doctor Universe. So, it's, it's literally it's all my life. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that is pretty cool. And that, I, correct me if I'm wrong, you're a similar age to me, mid-40s. So you've been through the ringer when it comes to Doctor Who fandom, just like I have in the dark times between Sylvester McCoy and Christopher Eccleston. Is that right? Well, of sorts, actually. I wasn't really a fan of Classic Who until much later. I remember Sylvester McCoy as a kid. I remember The Curse of Fenric. And the cheetah people in survival, the last you know, the last few episodes. I remember the Daleks in I uh, remember the Daleks. All the stuff that was supposed to McCoy. I don't know if I actually watched it earlier than that. I'm I'm 40, so I'm probably a couple of years behind you. So I remember it being right. on TV. So I would have been eight when it finished. And I don't remember watching it religiously, but now delving back into Doc Two and, and watching I I between myself and some Ben, we have almost every single story on DVD or Blu-ray. So all going all the way back to William Hartnell. And so when you watch those McCoy ones, I go, oh, I remember that very vividly as this kind of child of memories. And so for me, really, Doctor Who was the TV movie 96 of Paul McGann, and then probably becoming a fan with 2005 with, with, with Christopher Eccleston, sorry. So um, yeah, I kind of got into it like a lot of people with the revival, but I was aware of it. And right. um, so I, I've gone back and, I, and I've, I've, I've experienced the classic Doctor Who. I, I adore Doctor Who. Tom Baker's my favourite Doctor. And it, mm. it kind of, I guess Doctor Who means, means a lot to me in three ways. One, it's because I sh- share with my son, Ben. So Ben um, is obsessed with it. He's, he's actually on the spectrum, on all the, I suppose, the spectrum. He, he does very well. He, he manages socially, um, intelligent. You know, he's very, very good. He manages his life. But one of the things about being on the spectrum is obsessions and heavily focused. And Ben is so heavily focused on Doctor Who. He is obsessed with it. He has everything. He has the books. He has the comics. His knowledge far surpasses my own, actually. So it's something we share mm. together. So that's why I started doing the podcast. I thought, do I do another podcast? I thought, we talk about this. Let's just share that love that we have of Doctor Who together. So it's it's a great way to kind of, I mean, I, I, Ben's a geek as well. I've raised him well. And, you know, we, we love <laughs> Marvel. We love Star Wars. He likes a little bit of Star Trek. and Not as much as I would like, but he's getting there. But, you know, Doc 2 is the thing that we share the most and we both love. We have talking about it and watch it together and stuff. And that's great. And um, 
but also my best friend from six on college actually and my best mate dan as well he was really into the classic stuff and kept telling me to watch it and i go oh maybe i'll get around to watch it one day because I was a kid, a kid of the nineties, you know, a teenager of the nineties, I should say. Mm. So for me, you know, Babylon Five, um, Space and Above and Beyond, the Star Trek generation, DS Nine, that stuff, all that kind of sci-fi sliders, Quantum Leap. That's where my geek com- comes from. Which actually was probably when Doctor Who wasn't around, so that's probably why I missed it first time round. But I've now gone back into mm. Classic Who, and now I can just share that and discuss that and, and share that love with my, with my best friend as well. And of course now. I write for characters that were in the classic era of Doctor Who as well. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's all encompassing now. That's fascinating. I'm genuinely surprised by that. I had made an assumption about you, yeah. <laughs> and it was wrong. And that's actually fascinating. But what I do love about your podcast with Ben, with the, the TARDIS crew, it's just... It is about a topic that I love, but there's also so much kind of love between you and Mm. your boy. And it's just, it's got a charm and a complete uniqueness in a world full of Doctor Who podcasts. So, yeah, I I love your podcast. And if people haven't listened to it and they like Doctor Who, they should be listening to it because it is a unique Doctor Who podcast in a world of Doctor Who podcasts that aren't unique. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot out there yeah, there's a lot out there isn't there so I, and, and, that, and that's what actually i mean good we, we don't actually get massive numbers when we're, we're never going to be hitting the kind of records of, of the best podcast download download your podcast on we made this because there are so mm. many of them but we, yeah we've, we've carved out a little niche audience and you're right it's about love of doctor who you know we talk about classic and modern and the, the big finish stuff as well we're big fans of that so we try and go with a positive love of doctor who. you know we will be critical at times because nothing's perfect, you know, and some things won't always work for us. But we try, we try and go in there with a really positive nature and, and just kind of share that love and, and our thoughts in it rather than go in and go, well, this is a crap episode. Let's talk about that. You know, we'll, we'll try and find the positive spin out. Our very first episode we did, and Ben picked this, was Time Lash, which is a six dot episode, which is generally regarded as one of the worst. It's a brave choice. Yeah, yeah. One of the worst stories of all time. I don't think it's the worst by far. I think it's a few, quite a few stories that are worse than it. But going in maybe it's our mission statement going in with okay our first full episode we're going to talk about time lash and like that's where we're that's where we're going we're going there and we're going to we're kind of defending it and putting a bit of a positive spin there's a lot of stuff about time lash that is absolutely naff i did doff my hat to <laughs> your choice of time lash i was like well they are brave yeah and i think you've kind of i don't see why we can't talk about this you have kind of given a little peek behind the curtain of the network that we're on. This show doesn't get great numbers either, I'll be honest. Mm. But podcasts I do that get, like, kind of jaw-dropping numbers, you you, you think, you, you take a step back and you're like, that many people mm. listen to my podcast. They want to hear what I've got to say about this. And it's for more niche stuff. You're absolutely right. So Red Dwarf and Chucky are the two that get huge numbers that I do. But I do this for fun, Yeah, this one. And I like the conversations I have. And who knows, maybe its numbers will pick up. But I genuinely don't think it will. There's so many podcasts out there. And the niches are where it's going. So I think a little peek behind the curtain is that's probably where the network is going to focus going Mm. forward, is niche TV shows, which don't have a lot of podcasts about them. Well, absolutely. I mean, I've just launched the Babylon 5 podcast and it hit top 10 in the first month being launched. It's, you know, it's done very, very Bonkers, well. Isn't it? And I, I was amazed, you know, I'm, I'm used to not, not the numbers and not to go, oh, okay, oh, we've hit double figures and we're getting a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. And then it was like hundreds. I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting this. And because you like niche TV shows, Babylon 5 is, is big. I'm briefly going to that one. It's actually my favorite show of all time, as much as I adore Doctor Who. Battle of Fire is my favorite show. But it's one of those shows, because mm. of a possible reboot and because of so much love out there and not that many podcasts, it's touched the market. Like, like your Chucky one, I think your Chucky one did extraordinarily well because there wasn't anything out there like that. And it got an audience. There was, but there was no one who was consistent like we mm. were. We posted every week we yeah. were consistent we had a mission statement we told you what we were going to do as a podcast and we did it and all the others out there that were including with some famous names actually just mm. didn't stay consistent and i think people stuck with us because they knew they could trust us in a lot of ways yeah but i think i'll go back to the tardis crew i do the tardis crew because it's our love of dot two it's something i share with ben mm. and 
Ben has so much, you can probably tell, he has so much enthusiasm and passion for Doctor Who. It's adorable. Yeah, it is. It is adorable. I love it. And it just, oh, why not share that with the world? And we've had some really good positive feedback and we've had some guests on and, yeah. and, and, and Ben loves it too. And he, he loves, to, he loves, particularly when we get guests on as well. To, I mean, and Mark, we'll get you on at some point, won't we? We've been planning to for a while. You will. We'll definitely get you on at some point soon as well. Um, because we're, we're, on, we're on hiatus while Ben's doing GCSEs at the moment for a couple of months. But um, we do it because we love it. We love talking about Doctor We talk about Doctor Who. We watch Doctor Who all the time. So why not share that with the world? And that and that's, and it's for the love of, love of Doctor Who and love of talking about Doctor Who. And that's why we do it. So if we're not going to get record-breaking numbers, if we're, we're going to be a bit more small scale. That's fine because, you know, we, we do it. As we do with most podcasts, don't we, Mark? We, we podcast because we love what we're talking about. That's the important part. And like I say, I've got two successful and two differently successful podcasts that I'm doing at the moment. And I'm happy with that. I would, I love doing this podcast just as much as the ones that are getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of listens, you know. Right, let's move on and actually get into the meat of your geekery. What was your first encounter with Doctor Who? Right, so there's it's like a three part story. So I remember Sylvester McCoy as a kid. I remember the cheetah people in survival very vividly. The cheetah people, the horses. I love that. I, I love survival anyway. It's it's um, it's a favorite of mine too. Yeah, that and Curse of Fenric. I think I, I think that the end of the classic era and McCoy particularly ends very strong. And uh, I remember those. So there were certainly memories of watching Classic Doctor Who as a kid, probably on a, on a Sunday afternoon when I was very young, but. For me, getting Doctor Two, there were, there were two aspects. One was the Paul McGann TV movie. That's when I was, you know, when I was properly in Greece in my geekdom. Yeah, you know, nineteen ninety six is I was um I was buying DS nine on VHS, watching Star Trek on uh, mm. on, on, on BBC Two, watching Space and Above and Beyond, watching Babylon Five and Channel Four. You know, all these shows, falling in love with these geek shows. Yeah, so when Doctor Two came out, it was like I've heard about this show. And um, I don't think it was really accessible at the time. It was, it, it was probably worse than VHS tapes, but I remember that and, and quite enjoying it. But Very it, limited VHS tapes, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so it, it kind of came and went and was kind of like, oh, I, I quite liked some of, that, some of that stuff. And Paul McGann's fantastic. And actually, Paul McGann didn't get much on TV, but his big finish audio work is phenomenal. One of the best they do with his character. 100% agree. Yeah, yeah. And we rated an episode on him because he's so, so, so good. But then when he came back in 2005... It was just after uni. It was actually a year before Ben was born. So Ben Ben was actually born a year into Modern Doctor Who. That's how young he is. I know how, how old we are. But um, this was when we were... Uh, <laughs> so it was not long after uni. A um, load of us were living in Cardiff, all friends together. I, I was married to my wife, Gem, who I met at university, Ben's mum at the time. Yeah, we just... I remember we all go around people's houses and we and we watch Lost and we watch Dot 2 and we and we're all sit, like, like, just sitting down and watching Dot 2 and just really, really enjoying it and and, and really, you know, I, I'd heard, seen some Ross Davis stuff before, I'd seen Christopher Eccleston stuff previously and, um, yeah, just... I remember the hype of Billy Piper. Going, Billy Piper's going to be a companion, really? That pop star from the early nineties. But I had the same reaction. Yeah, everyone did exactly the same. And but then just fall in love with it. And then yeah, the David Tennant came along, and then Matt Smith came along, who was my favourite of the modern Doctors. And it just kept going and going and going. And I think by the time the fiftieth came round, um, I remember going to see Day of the Doctor at the cinema with Ben and Jem and all these people in costume, and just the reactions to that was phenomenal. And mm. then, um, mm. yeah, actually, I think from the beginning of the beginning of the Peter, Peter Capaldi era, um, I was reviewing it regularly for the site I used to write for, Digital Fix, and I've actually reviewed every single episode of Doc Two since Peter Capaldi came along. And um, obviously, now that's transitioned from I think I, I was reviewing Jodie Whittaker's Doctor up until the um, second Dalek New Year's Day special, and then I moved away from writing, went more into podcasting, and now we're, now we're reviewing those on the podcast as well. So yeah, it keeps on going. I'm so I, I'm still <laughs> reviewing Doctor Who now, and I and I probably always will. You know, whether it's in written form or in, on podcast form, it, it's gonna it's gonna stay with me. And where it's, some things are better than others, you know, some stories are better than others, some writers are better than others, some doctors are better than others. I'm gonna stick with it, and I'm um, I'm really excited for what's to come. So you know, it, it's great to kind of be part of that and, and and as a fan and just to kind of share that love and um and, and watch it and review it all at the same time for me i had to look it up 
because I have a very, very vivid memory from my childhood, a traumatic memory, I'll be honest. Mm. And um, that was the death of Perry in Trial of the Time Lord. So my guess is that I started watching it in 85 with some of the um, 45 minute Colin Baker episodes, but didn't really understand it perhaps because I was what seven but no I it was etched into my brain the shaved head dead hairy story it was absolutely harrowing for me as a kid so in 1986 I would have been eight that feels about the right age to have started watching Mm. Doctor Who that makes sense and subsequent to Trial of the Time Lord I did get massively massively into Sylvester McCoy I would say that I understood Sylvester McCoy stuff where I was just kind of family watching Colin Baker's stuff. Yeah. But yeah, the Perry's death, absolutely devastated. Kind of, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, I cried, but I, I, I you know, I was eight. And that's a yeah. long time ago now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so since then, I just became pretty obsessed with it and it never went away and you talked about the McGann film that to me was like the last kind of big great hope and then when it didn't get picked up by America again I was devastated absolutely devastated I was obviously in my early teens at that point and um, I never believed we'd see Doctor Who Mm. again so the, the Christopher Eccleston thing was just like the best thing to happen to me that year. And I was well into my twenties by that point. And I should have been a bit more dignified about it perhaps, (laughs) but I wasn't. It was like the best year, the best day, the best. Oh, it was just, it mattered, Mm. still matters. 10 years after the last kind of flicker of television with um, Paul McGann. Yeah. So what is it to you about Doctor Who that particularly appeals to you over all the other sci-fi over anything else that you could be into. It's because it can be a completely different show every week. It can be a comedy. It can be action. It can be horror. It can be really thought-provoking drama. It can be very clownish. It can be very silly. It can be very fantastical. It's it's everything. I I love that the scope is so broad that really really you don't you don't know what you're going to get week on week. Some of the eras of Doctor Who are a bit more up and down. Some are stronger than others. And, and even you go, okay, I mean, I'm not quite enjoying this era as much. There's still that kind of excitement of what's next week going to be about. You know, we, we, we've gone from a hard sci-fi drama to suddenly we're on on this kind of historical romp in the past sort of thing. And and mm. it's I think the closest I can probably think of is something like Star Trek, where Star Trek can can do a lot of variety of episodes, particularly from the, the kind of the TNG era onwards. But there's still that kind of confines within the spaceship. Whereas I think this can be anything. And I think that's what's what's so great about it. You, re- it's a new kind of show, almost week on week on week. And um, yeah, I, I love that unexpectedness of, of what we're going to get. And it's also a show that is able to stay fresh all the time. Mm. And I mean, the, the 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 idea of regenerations is a masterstroke in storytelling. It's the lifeline. The Doctor Who would not be around if it wasn't for this idea of regeneration. No. So the fact no. is. Every single season or two seasons, you'll get a new main character, whether it's a companion or a doctor. Is sometimes you, you you want them to stick around longer, and 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 it's gutting when they leave. But at the same time, there's yeah, it's always that excitement of yeah, who are we going to get next? Now you know we've just right now, as we call this, we've just we've got um, Shooty Gatwa coming in as the 14th Doctor. So there's an excitement and buzz around around him. And I haven't seen him and stuff, but I, I, I we did a mini episode on Tyler's crew with uh, Matt Latham. Who had seen him with education mm. was talking about how 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 he wasn't how he was one of the star of that show, and there's been such buzz and excitement for this actor coming on board. And it's not to take away from Jodie Whittaker, you know. I'm looking forward to seeing how it wraps up. We and I think yeah. Jodie herself has been good, even though I, I don't think good things. So the writing's been as strong, but yeah, it's it's kind of it's, it's sad when you, when doctors go or a companion goes, and exciting when someone else comes. So Doc Two is never boring; it should never be boring because. You know, maybe an individual episode can be a bit disappointing, but week on week, it's always something new. And season upon season upon season or series here in the UK, there it's almost like a new cast. You you you're very unlikely to get the same cast for more like two years. 
but it's still the Doctor. Mm. It's still a Doctor with a companion who's traveling through space and time. So the core concept will always remain, but you've always got something new and exciting. I, I can't really think of another show that really shakes things up like that and it's so varied week on week that it's not it's not predictable and that's a great thing yeah and i agree with everything that you say on that but that isn't the reason why i love doctor who for me it's all about the main protagonist and the fact that he or she now mm. is something i'm not something that i think i'd like to be but i don't think i ever will and that's i've written down a few things to describe what I would aspire to be if I was a better person. And um, I think the most important thing is intelligent, non-violent solutions. Mm. And I'm a massive, I'm, you know, I'm a pacifist, I'm a humanist, I'm a humanitarian, but I get angry and I get upset about things and I don't solve problems. I just get angry. Mm. Whereas the doctor always comes up with an intelligent, non-violent solution to the most horrific of problems. Yeah. Beyond that, I think I like the idea of being a nomad, but really that's not who I am. I'm very much a homemaker. And I like to think I'm a good person, but I don't think I'm a hero or a man of action. And I love the idea of adventure yeah. without the worry of rent. But I, 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 I can't afford that. I can't afford to not worry about rent. And therefore, there's a limitation to how much of a nomad and how much adventure I can have. And um, yeah, there's something about the doctor that it's not that I want to be that, but it's that I kind of admire who they are and they are a different person who does good if that makes any kind of sense. It, it makes perfect sense. The Doctor's a role model, and that's what's fantastic about the character. The Doctor is there solving problems. The Doctor isn't there with a gun, shooting away to kill the bad guys. The Doctor is there thinking out the situation, coming up with solutions, getting people together, and kind of working together for, for the greater good. You know, it, it's always... It's great to see how the Doctor solves problems, and it's, mm. it's heroic, and it's uplifting, and um, when they're at the best... You know, it, it's a joy to kind of follow that journey and be surprised because never in a million years would you think of that's how you solve that problem. And um, I mean, it, and yes, it does come down to the quality of the writing and sometimes it can be a bit silly or a bit cliche or a bit obvious, but when it's good, it's fantastic. When you get those heroic Doctor moments, it, it's amazing to watch on screen, whatever actors playing a Doctor. And they, they are role models. I and mean, that's why I'm, I'm, I love that Jodie Whittaker played a Doctor, because also, I, I don't think the, the Doctor was purely a role model for boys, and, and boys and men, but I think, you know, we were growing up, but I think there's a, there's a female hero that, that, that can be relatable to as well for a bigger part of the audience. And I think, you know, I don't know if you're two broad genders, because obviously it's, it's far more complex than that, but, you know, it's, yeah. it's opened up a role model on TV for a bigger audience. It's a family show. It's in, there's children watching and, and giving them another role model to follow as well. And I think mm. that's fantastic. You know, the companions too as well. The companions are very much the the human eyes on the show. And certainly are in the modern era. I, I think it was very, it's very different in the classic era. Dot two probably Ace was the closest we had to kind of a modern era style companion. But yeah. The, the the companions are that audience's world in, into the world dot two in that fantastical world and it's it's magical it is magical and uh, mm. yeah it's a great to kind of for for the uh, the companion too as as they become part of Doctor's world and they become heroes too you know the Doctor makes them heroes I think I think that that's a wonderful thing and I think mm. it's such a positive show when it when it's at its best it's such a positive show and the Doctor is such a role model for so many people. And I, th I think that's why it continues to be as popular as it is in, in a way, I think, because it it's something, it can be big and it can be epic. I, I, don't, I don't think essentially it's, it's designed to or should really complete, compete on the levels of, you know, some of the really big like US sci-fi action shows and films. No. I think it's something slightly different than that. And I think it's about having that journey that the audience can follow and can and kind of either relate to or understand and f kind of feel uplifted by as well. So, yeah, I think you have, what, what, what I think what I hear from what you're saying is the, the doctor is a role model. The doctor inspires you to be yeah. better. The doctor um, is, is this hero. And I, I think that's a great thing, great thing yeah. to watch. 
So, this is going to probably be the toughest question, I think. Who's your favourite doctor? Tom Baker. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Well, Why? I've had this conversation several times on the Tyler's Crew, so I'm probably... Well, I, I've, got, I've, got a, I've got a few. Um, Tom Baker, going back and watching the classic era of Tom Baker, particularly the Philip Hinchcliffe stuff, the, the first three seasons with um, Harry and Sarah Jane is the, my favourite TARDIS dynamic of all time. Right. And I wish Harry had been it longer, but no, I, I love it. I love all the gothic horror stuff. It's only about the, 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 the uh, heroism, the uplifting stuff. I really love when Doctor does gothic horror and everything from Planet of Evil, Tanza Wang Chiang, horror fan rock, which I know is technically off, off the Hinchcliffe, you know, Mask and Dragora. The Seat of Doom is my absolute favorite. We just did an episode on that and um, recently on Tardis Crew. Mm. Seat of Doom is my absolute favorite, and particularly um, Elizabeth Sladen as Sarah. Jane Smith and Tom Baker's fourth doctor is magical. So for me, that yeah. this, those stories are just so big and fantastical, but they've got such depth to them as well and such amazing characters. And yeah, I love it when he goes gothic horror. So for me, that's my favorite. Um, probably very closely followed by uh Matt Smith and Amy Rory and River. That's my favorite dynamic on the TARDIS, you know, having to fall them together mm. in uh in, in those first three seasons of Matt Smith's Doctor, well, the earlier three seasons, but the first two and a half was my kind of favourite from the modern era too. Yeah, and I think I think it's okay to have a favourite classic and a favourite mm. reboot. What, what do we call it? Modern era. And um, for me, it really is as simple as the Doctor that I watched the most on telly mm. because of my age. That is Sylvester McCoy. Yeah. And um, I think as a Doctor even more so than Tom Baker or John Pertwee, who had kind of strangely ongoing plots in a lot of places, and Peter Davison to some extent, yeah. whereas I don't really feel like Colin Baker did, and because the trial of the Time Lord is its own thing. But um, <laughs> yeah, so this the ongoing plot of the Doctor starting quite discombobulated from his regeneration and becoming darker and darker and more almost sinister yes but not quite and yeah he i I loved that storyline and watching it as a young adult subsequently i got more out of it than when i was watching it in when i was in my eight nine ten eleven and again now i still love watching sylvester mccoy's stuff honorary mention to the sixth doctor particularly on big finish but for me modern era it has to be Eccleston. I think there was something about the gravitas of the actor being casted mm. that just hit me before I'd seen him say a line. But beyond that, I think he really was exactly what Doctor Who needed at that moment in time. And yeah, we all know that it didn't end the way he would have liked, Russell T. Davis would have liked, we would have liked. But those 13 episodes really were. And I know, I'm sorry. Fantastic. <laughs> it's such a great... None it? of them were bum episodes. Not no, one. They no. were all brilliant. His run is perfect. Wow. I, I do agree it's a very strong season. I, I think um, less fun of the Slovene stuff, particularly the first two parts, of, but I, I, there, there's such an energy to that first season. It's a very, very well-made, very, very, very strong first season. Uh, I, I would love to see Eccleston more. I, I, I assume you've listened to him in the Big Finish stuff because he actually is great in that as well. He's come back with the same energy on Big Finish that he had on TV. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I've not heard them yet. I'm excited to. Though. Yeah. There, there's some, there's, some, there's some definitely some uh, really, really fun stuff there. And uh, yeah, I, I really, really big fan of, of Eccleston's first season. I would love to have seen him more. As much as I love David Tennant when, when he came along as well and what he did. I th- Yeah, I think the... Um, the Rose and Ninth Doctor dynamic was great as well. My, for me, much, much stronger than the Tenth Doctor and Rose dynamic. I find that a little bit, a little bit toxic almost, but um, that's probably another story. But yeah, I, I think Eccleston's first Eccleston run of Doctor Who is, um, is fantastic, yeah, to, to, to uh, coin his phrase. And um, I really love that. And McCoy as well, you know, you, you speak of mine, because I remember some of the elements of McCoy. There's something wonderful about going back and kind of getting flashes of childhood memory, but also actually they're bloody good stories. That final season yeah. of season 26, Doctor, is fantastic. I, I adore Battlefield. I, I, I think Ghost Light is very, very good. Um, it's confusing the hell first time around, but the more you watch it, you enjoy. Curse of Fenric one of my favourite Doctors of all time. I love I love Survival. And um, 
Yeah, I, I, I remember. I remember seeing Hal and Pace on TV when I was a kid, and recognised them from TV and and the Cheetah People and, and Ace with the glowing eyes and the mask. Oh yeah, I, lo- I I love Survival so much. So that again, his final season particularly is a really really strong end. Doc Two ended really really well. It's a shame it cancelled yeah. because it was it was it was really going from strength to strength. Yeah, I think you're right, and um, the comic books, particularly the. Um... Paul McGann comic books, but also the Sylvester McCoy comic books mm. were always excellent in that period of time in Doctor Who magazine as well. And it showed that they made a mistake, in my mm. opinion, cancelling it. They had these writers who could write incredible things at their fingertips for a show that they just abandoned. But I think they were probably doing such good stuff, such a bit darker stuff as well, is because no one was watching. I think if it was as popular mm. as it was, maybe we wouldn't have got some. I think it's, it's like a two edged sword. I think the darker storyline they were going with, obviously they hoped for another season. But mm. the storyline they were doing, I mean, Ace is very much kind of a proto rose. She's very much, particularly when you, go, when you go to survival and Perry Valley and stuff, Ace is very much, there's not that much difference between Seventh Doctor and Ace and the Ninth Doctor and Rose in a way. There's, there's a very similar kind of feel to no. their story. So they, they were, I think, as much as Rose, uh, the, the episode, and obviously the first season of the modern Doctor Who was Doctor Who for a modern age and was very different, very fast paced. I know he, he, he used like the Buffy model for the kind of big battle of the seasons, which all worked brilliantly. I think you can mm. see with the end of the McCoy stuff how it was starting to transition and it's not quite as jarring as you might think. If you look at, say, Survival and then probably going to Rose, you'd see it is more, more modern, but from a narrative yeah. speaking, it's probably, probably quite similar. So. I would be fascinated to see if you get something I don't know on this question, because this is my strongest geekery, I would say. <laughs> what is the most obscure fact that you know about Doctor Who? Oh, what have I, what's Ben told me? Because <laughs> Ben knows more yeah. than me. Uh, yeah, that's about um, oh, I have so many facts. It's like, what, what's obscure and what do people know? Because the thing is, the fandom knows so much. That there's, there's mm. so much you go, oh, this isn't it? And they, they know it straight away. The, the fandom is obsessive, you know, for, for good and for bad. The fandom's obsessive about Doctor Who. Mm. Oh, I, I, th- I, th- I don't actually know what the answer is. Uh, the most obscure fact about Doctor Who. Shall I go first? Go on, you go for, go and for it. Yeah, you, go on, go and then you tell me if you know yeah. this. So it was initially canon. Mm. that suicide of a Time Lord changes your gender. And that was established in Unbound Exile by Big Finish, where the Doctor became Arabella Weir. Did you know that one? I did not know. Ben would have done. I didn't know that one. So, yeah, the Doctor took their own life and changed gender. And that was because it was Big Finish. It was technically canon. Mm. But obviously the Christopher Eccleston thing where technically he took his own life to save rose actual taking your own life changes your gender was the original canon for regeneration so there you go there you go i'm there i, f- I feel like I-, I should be asking you but i'll do it <laughs> <laughs> I don't we, 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 de- so. we definitely need your entire crew at some point <laughs> happy to go on then give me give me an obscure fact I, I'm, I've actually drawn a blank because of so, much, so much I've written about Doctor Who and I talk about Doctor Who. And I'm trying to think about, yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask Ben. One second, he's actually here. Okay. Yeah. Ben! Thanks, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, there was once a lawsuit between the BBC over the rights to the police box, which is obviously the TARDIS is designed on. Um, do you know who actually right. won the lawsuit? Well, I would guess, if it was between the BBC and the police, that if they were still able to use the police box, that it was the BBC. But I hadn't heard of this before. Yeah. No, well, the BBC won because the police box was so ingrained in cultural consciousness as belonging to Dot Who, the police actually lost the lawsuit so yeah <laughs> so <laughs> no i, didn't I, I, I guess that. the police box is now trademarked to doc two more than what it was to the police even though even though <laughs> they were actually around in the 60s so yeah I, that's, a, that's a great fact amazing 
So obviously there is a huge, huge amount of Doctor Who. Where would you say would be a good place to start for a beginner coming into it to start their Doctor Who journey? Oh, there's probably a few starting points, really. I've, I thought there's a lot, actually. So if you, you're probably going to start with modern Doctor Who, I would have thought. There's, there's a few points of classic as well. So I would actually start with, with either Rose, which is go back, we, because you said that, that mm-hmm. first season with Christopher Eccleston is fantastic. It's a, it's a great jumping point. Naturally, it's a jumping on point. I would also argue that Love Hour, Matt Smith, because the season series five with Matt Smith, Amy, Rory, and uh, the cracks in time on I mean, the end of the power and darker. That's my favorite of the, of the modern series of dot two. And I think it's such a great strong narrative journey and there's such an energy and it's got that confidence that's, that's been built over the last few years of dot two with Moffat's flair. Moffat for me is my favorite writer from dot two anyway. So mm. I would say length hour, but I think you can easily go with Rose. I'll say they're the probably two strongest points because they're with Tennant and Capaldi and arguably even Jodie Whittaker, even though it's a complete new showrunner and Doctor and Companions. I, I don't know. I mean, you could argue Jodie Whittaker. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the first time since probably the hour you've got that cut. But Modern Doctor 2, I'm going to say you do uh, Live Hour and go from there or go from Rose. But mm. if you want to go classic, there's you don't start with the black and white. You come back to black and white and you appreciate how good they are once you get into it. Yeah. You, you, can, you can do an unearthly child. And there's some great stuff in unearthly child and Daleks and there's also some not great stuff. But I, I, I'm quite fond of those early ones. But you probably want to start with Ark in Space, Tom Baker's second episode because the first episode, Robot, is very much a hangover of the John Pertwee era. As much as mm. I, 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 love, I love the John Pertwee era, and I love Unit, and obviously I've written for Unit, so yeah, th- these characters are quite fun to my heart. I would say you start with Ark in Space, which is Harry, Sarah, and then the fourth Doctor going off into space and the adventure. That's a fantastic starting point for Classic Doctor Two. The other place, if you wanted a, a smaller taste of it, and actually it's probably more accessible for modern fans, is to start with Sylvester McCoy's second season and do Remembrance of the Daleks and do his final two seasons. Because I think mm. you've got everything in those modern ones. As, as I said, there's a little bit of a... It's not quite as far removed from modern Dot 2 as, as some of the early companions, particularly Ace, who has had much more depth and, and agency to a character than, any, than probably most Dot 2 companions have had. Particularly Mel. Actually, mm, yeah, ignoring her runs on Big Finish, yes, Mel and Big Finish is a different Mel, yes, absolutely. But the Mel, the Mel that um, was dumped on Sylvester McCoy's Doctor was so one dimensional, oh, just yeah. fitness fanatic 80s girl. Mm. It was just like, come on, it was terrible. And uh, yeah, uh, the that first Sylvester McCoy series is quite painful to watch at times. Um, there, there's, there's a charm mm. to it, and it's fun. But it's it's really really painful, and then is that 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 switch between even Dragonfire and Remember the Daleks is so so different. It's suddenly he becomes a little darker and a little bit more mysterious. You know the, the whole yeah. cult master plan that they, 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 they were going with with his dots to make him bring him back to being a more mysterious, aloof figure. Who well, not say aloof, but you know, certainly, certainly someone who's not quite the friendly. We don't know everything about him. There's a lot of a lot of stuff to his past that we don't know. And and him putting the strings, you know, the horns with Fenric as well, and, and Ace. So, arguably, you could say if you you start the modern era, you do Rose or you do Love Hour, and then you want to go in a classic era, you start with McCoy's final two seasons, and you give that a go, and you enjoy that, and then you go back to maybe Tom Baker and start with Ark in Space and go from mm. his first two or three seasons. They will probably be the, the uh, best jumping on points. I think I would agree with Christopher Eccleston. Because, again, because he was fantastic and it allows you the reset, but isn't disrespectful to the old stuff. It's, yeah. There's no regeneration, for example. And I think that's actually quite important that there's a, almost a mystery establishment for a new new person watching it. And potentially your first regeneration experience could be at the end of series one mm. of the, the the new series. But I thought maybe, but again, maybe this is my age compared to being just that little bit older than you, that Trial of a Time Lord would be a great place to start because it was kind of the trial of the show as well as 
the actual character. And your more modern viewer does like an overlying story arc. And Trial of the Time Lord was way ahead mm. of its time. No show was really doing that at that point. The final two episodes are peculiar, but they <laughs> are great, in my opinion. The Valiard, Mr. Popplewick, oh. evil versions of the Doctor. And I think it does give you something. It does. I know what you mean about the idea of kind of arc based storytelling, long form storytelling, which is very prevalent in modern TV that wasn't there. You know, obviously, Doctor, Doctor have just done it now with Flux, for example. Um, a mm. very, very uh, breakneck space, a breakneck pace to it, you know, but it, it's done that. I, I don't think it ends very strongly for me. So I, I yeah, I, I see your argument. And um, I don't think any of the stories are, are probably classic. So you might get in the Sylvester McCoy, era, but. There's some good stuff there. The other, the other flip side of that is you, you do key to time. You do Tom Baker's uh, fifth season when he's when again there's an ongoing storyline looking for the key to time. So you've got that kind of ongoing story arc running throughout the season, and they've got the black and the white guardian. So you've kind of got some mysterious yeah, things as well. True. So that would be, and there's probably a bit strong, there's some stronger material there than I would say the Trial of a Time Lord, because I think the Sixth Doctor suffered so badly on TV. You're right. The Sixth Doctor on Big Finish. My, my, my favourite Sixth Doctor stuff is the Sixth Doctor Contents and Flip, which people who don't watch, people won't listen to Big Finish, won't even know who they are. But that dynamic, I love that dynamic. That's one of my favourite Tardis teams as well. And that's a purely Big Finish mm. team. And Colin Baker, like yes. Paul McGann, is so, so, so good on, on Big Finish. You know, It, it, it really yep, is a shame that we didn't get that level of Doctor on TV because it, it, I think, you know... If you and this is on bus you on TV, I would always choose Tom Baker. If you put a Tom Baker and a Colin Baker big finish audio front and listen to one of these, I might be tempted to go for the, the Colin Baker one because that's how good he is on, on big finish. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 I like your, the idea of yeah of, of the uh, long form story turn the art going around it. I would say counter that with Key to Time, but they've, they've both got their um, plus in terms of being mm. something relatable to a more modern audience too. Hmm. So the last question is one I don't know whether I should carry on doing because it's a bit neg. But um, the examples I've given in the past, and you can probably work out which franchises I'm talking about, but Cancel Too Soon, Problematic Old mm. Stuff, Toxic Fandom, The Writer is a Fucking Turf. Um, is there anything you're unhappy with regarding Doctor Who? Not really. The fandom, as I said, is very passionate. and. Mm. There's a lot of positivity, but there's so much negativity too. It's it's horrible to watch, to watch and experience. Like, for example, I run the TARDIS crew Twitter account. I don't look at the stuff on it. I, I will follow people who are interested. I, I look and make sure they're not right wing nut jobs. And if they're not, I probably they're going to be decent enough people based on their persona and mm. what they're posting. I'll follow them so you know to get engagement on on the account. And occasionally I'll see something and I'll interact with a little bit. But on the whole, I try and avoid it. Not because I I don't really care what people are, are, are saying. It's because there's so much toxic negativity on there. You saw it with right. Jodie Whittaker. I uh, know you're saying you, you, you've already had. I'm not racist, but there I saw a post oh, the other, for other day. Um, I'm sh- I saw a shooty and uh, Gat will be a great doctor, but a white doctor deserves to have the role because of this and this is this. It's like I'm not racist, what? but and then proceed to be incredibly racist, and it's like <sighs> and it's it's the antithesis of what doctor doctor is about being inclusive and being good and being heroic yeah. and you get all this... the main characters are fucking pan romantic asexual if it isn't more inclusive than that i don't know what yeah, it is exactly and i think between the their for example the, the thasmin stuff with the 13 doctor and yaz there's been mm. they, they brought that into the show i know they haven't resolved that because there's one episode left to go they bought into it because they picked up on the on the audience kind of picking up on this possible connection between them, and I quite I think they've they've not done a good enough job of kind of of really putting enough time into it. But I like that they're trying they're trying to do this. But they've picked up on the positive of the show. But on another flip side, there'll be people who are so so against it, and and they go, I'm not trying to be sexist. I'm not trying to be racist. I'm not trying to be whatever it is I'm trying to be. But I think Doctor is is constant. I see this a lot because the other thing I do, I follow a lot of the um, Doctor 
pages on Facebook again to get the engagement, you know, and mm. post stuff and trying to get them engagement. Yeah. But you see, thank God Jodie Wicker's leaving. It's not going to be woke anymore. It's like, have you seen Rusty Davis? What, what he does? It's like Doctor Who was insane. All, I, I, I despise the term woke anyway, because it basically is you're woke. Therefore, you know, I hate people who are woke. What? Because you hate people who are decent human beings. Oh, I wear woke as a badge of honor. Mate. Yeah, I, I do too. And um, it, I, I, I don't, I, I don't understand it. And they go, oh, Doctor Who was too is too political now. Have you watched the Green Death with John Pertwee? <laughs> you know, it's like I know, it's right? Like, and it, oh, and it will. And actually, if they if they think, oh, it, Doctor Who is too woke now with a female Doctor, then wait till Rusty Davis comes along because I'm sure there'll be stuff that you are going to be absolutely hate and you can fuck right. Yeah, you can fuck right off and I don't care because it's not Dot 2 for you because Dot 2 is about inclusive for everyone. And uh, yeah. If I was being particularly crass, I would say that Doctor Who is the only left-wing thing left on the BBC, but that would be me being a little bit crass. Yeah, I, I, know, I know what you're saying. Yeah, it's... um, I mean, there's one thing, see, for example, the Chibnall era of Dot 2... I don't think Chimnall is a very good show one. I don't think he's a particularly good writer. I think Joji has suffered from having lots of poor scripts and storylines. But mm. the one thing I love what Chibnall's done is bringing a diversity to the show, you know, having the, the first female doctor, having a diverse companions, you know, and, and really some tackling into some stories like the Rosa story and stuff, you know. I don't think a lot of stuff's been as well executed, but I think the approach to a lot of the stuff has been fantastic. And I think that's, fan- that's, that's great and, and, and it should be out there. So, it's um yeah i there's a lot of the fandom and you see exactly with star trek as well star trek's too political these days oh fuck it was always political yeah but um yep and doctor who was always political um it was it was designed to teach people that was the whole point it was a it was to teach yeah. it was about science and history the daleks were basically weren't even planned they just happened to be very popular so yeah there's always been an element of politics in doctor who but I don't even really think of it as politics. I think it's about showing people how people can be good and how people can be inclusive and how can we... Being a decent human. Yes, that's exactly it. It's about people being decent to each other. Going back to the Doctor being a role model, thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. It's about defending those who can't defend themselves, potentially. It's about being a decent human being. It's about... Or de- decent alien, a decent person or being or whatever you want to call it because, you know, it's not just humans not to. And, True. yeah, it's... It's about that. So it riles me right up when you get these people, go, you know, and now, and now you're getting it. I'm not racist, but, and then proceed why it should T Gatwa shouldn't be because of his skin colour. It's like, it's like, it's so, so anti-doctor. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. You don't even get the show. And yeah, that that's one thing that riles me up. I think, and that, but it's not just linked to Doctor Who, Star Wars, Star Trek, or lots of big franchises will all have the same thing. But I think there's a particularly toxic fan base in doc two yeah and we've had some particularly unpleasant yeah. interactions with nasty nasty people mm. who are upset that we've pointed out stuff that is dated in red dwarf mm. for shipwrecked and comatose yeah and it's like you know fuck off actually yeah just just fuck off yeah you've got to understand context absolutely the only thing that i really had in my notes was that there is some but it's only gently problematic stuff. Like the perfect example is the racial stereotyping in Wang Chiang. Mm, yes. But considering how old Doctor Who is, it always had what you were talking about, a very positive, borderline woke attitude. Yeah. And I don't think there was any evil intent and any actual conscious racism no. in Wang Chiang. I think it was ignorance. Yeah. And there's a massive difference between ignorance and hatred. Absolutely. Uh, ignorance is curable. Hatred is not. Yeah, completely agree. And I think you, you do have to put context into stuff. I mean, I mean, I've, you know, Wang Chai right, right, is a prime example. It looks horribly racist. I mean, I think it's a fantastic storyline and there's some really amazing stuff in that storyline. But you watch it and you go, mm. oh, that's not great. But then you, you but you look at the context when it's written. I, I, don't, I don't say it to excuse yeah. that. I say you've got to understand when it's written. You, know, you can go as far back and you'll see stuff and you go, I can't believe it. I've um, I, I've done like film studies in the past. I've watched a film called Birth mm. of a Nation from like 1915. It ends with the Ku Klux Klan riding in to save a white woman from being raped by a black guy. And they ride in on horse, like the heroes. Fuck. And you, 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 that's the reaction you go and you go, holy fuck. Um, but, and, but then you can't, so you, you, you see this stuff and you have never ever been made today. 
but you see this stuff did study about history and I don't excuse that at all, but you, you kind of, you, you, you have to kind of understand context of when things were made and how things might have been yeah. different, how they might have been perceived. And it's not to say that yeah. was right. And I think, yeah, the idea of the Klux Klan as the heroes is mind staggeringly is a complete mind fuck. Absolutely. But I know. you, you kind of, you, th- th- there were different perspectives throughout history. And then when, in the context of when things are made, that would never be made. Now it was made at the time. And at the time it was, it was mm. acceptable. And thank God that's not acceptable now in the same way that you really, really hope Doc two does not do anything anywhere near as, as racist as Chan's Wang Chan. I hope they're making a story as good as Chan's Wang Chan but without all the, all the racism in it, you know, that's what, what you want. Yeah. And I'm fascinated. Yeah. Absolutely fascinated with what they're going to do with Shooty Gatwa mm. because they did gently, a little too gently, in my opinion, yeah. touch on racism with Martha Jones as a black character mm. in a household where she was essentially treated very badly. Mm. And I, But they haven't really put their claws into racism. No. And I really hope that with Shuti Gatwa, they look at racism straight on. Mm. And I think having the main protagonist as a black person is going to be great. I really, yeah. really do. The The scope for storytelling that needs to be told that they have now that they have an incredibly talented black actor as the doctor I'm excited. Yeah, genuinely excited. I, I completely agree. I, I'm. I, I haven't even seen. I've heard a lot of positivity around him because I haven't seen Sex Education. It's one of the shows on my list of shows to watch. But um, I've just started watching it because <laughs> the doctor's in it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's great. I really hope they do because they haven't done enough. They, they did a little bit with um, Martha. I think um, the Family of Blood two parter, which is a, an amazing story. They they did a little bit there. That was the one. They did a little bit. I think with Bill when Bill and Doctor go back into Rosa the park. Parks, and, and then they did Rosa Parks with the Thirteenth Doctor, yeah. and you get it with um, Yaz and Ryan. So they've done bits, but. It's like I, I wanted them to do more about the gender stuff with the doctor as well. I didn't want it to be a big thing every every week. They go, "Oh, you can't talk to you. You're, you're a woman." But I think, mm. bar maybe the witch finders episode with um, King Charles, I think it was. It was the guy Alan, Alan Cumming played. Oh, James Alan Cumming played him. I think there's no other episode where they went where they dealt within the idea of the, of the treatment of, of gender when they were a doctor. Mm. And in one sense, I like that they didn't really need to go down that route too much, and she's just the hero. But at the same time, I thought there was an opportunity to do a little bit on that, and they haven't done that. So I, I hope with with uh, Shooty as well, they definitely do something on those lines in in his Doctor. And I, I think Ross mm. Davis is definitely the man for the job on that. So I think I think you do great work. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. So Baz, it is quiz time, and what we do here is I write three fiendish quiz questions <laughs> for the expert. That's you, and the expert writes some medium level quiz questions for the polymath. That's me, and we have a bit of a competition. We see who wins, and then at the end we discuss whether or not the question levels were fair. So my question to you is. Do you want to ask first or do you want to be asked first? Let's be asked and I'll see how I get on. <laughs> All right. I, I wish I might, might, might need Ben here for this one. <laughs> I'm a little bit concerned about the first one. Go now, on but name any three of the Unbound Doctors in the Big Finish 6 CD run from 2003. Right. So David Warner is one of them. Mm-hmm. I know Mark Gatiss is the Unbound Master. I think you went a bit, a bit of um, frost drop. You mentioned, I think, but I don't know. I because I, I have I've only listened to the Unbound Master stuff. I've not listened to the Unbound Doctor stuff. It's on my list. There's so much big finish. So yeah, there is, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. There, 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 there was a ridiculous amount of uh, of big finish stuff. So no, I haven't listened to them enough to know. Unfortunately, I know David Warner is one of them. Certainly. So David Werner is one of them, and you will definitely kick yourself that Michael Jason is one of them. Yes. There's a disc where the Valiard is the Doctor. The others are Geoffrey Bailden, David Collings, Arabella Weir, and Derek Jacobi. Ah, oh, interesting, given the War Master stuff. The War Master stuff know, is, right? is, is my my favourite thing on Big Finish. I adore the War Master on Big Finish. I haven't listened to the oh, War Master stuff. I'll be have... honest, I haven't listened to any of the modern era stuff, Big Finish-wise. Ah, there's some good stuff. The, the Missy stuff and the War Master stuff is, is a joy to listen to. 
highly recommend it. I think my priority is going to be the Christopher Eccleston stuff. Yeah, that has but, good. Um, that, that's real, real, really fun. Yeah. All right. Number two, who played Sergeant Benton in Doctor Who? Oh, I know this because I've written for the character. It is um, John Levine. John Levine. Of course it is. Yes. Correct. So you got one out of two. I've, ju- I've, I've just written a story featuring Benton. So, yeah, I should know that one. <laughs> oh, shit. I, don't, I didn't know that. Um, so, you, you know, you've not got a duck, but yeah. two out of three would be better, let's yes, be let's honest. So your third question, and it's a, it's a shitty one, oh. and I'm not sorry. In the Children in Need special Dimensions in Time, yes. who were the options from the EastEnders cast that you could vote for to save the Doctor? Big Ron yeah, and the girl, and I can't remember the girl's name. <laughs> so you can remember the one that didn't win? Yes, because it was Big Ron. I remember Big Ron. <laughs> I remember she had dark hair. I cannot remember her name. Oh, Her name was Mandy Salter. I'm going to give you a half point. Thanks. So you've got one and a half <laughs> out of three. Oh, not good, is it? <laughs> no, I think that's respectable. They're deliberately supposed to be massively foolish. <laughs> okay. So your turn. What what have you got for me, Baz? Well, I have, I'm starting to regret my choices because I did not realise how much of a Doctor Who fan you are. Okay. Okay. So I might change one of my questions in a minute, but I'm going to start with question two then. Okay. There's been, and you, and you might get these, there have been many, many companions in Doctor Who, both on TV, on film, on comics and books, and it's not like you've got a lot of it. So I'm going to say, true or false, are these actually Doctor Who companions that have appeared? That, are, they, are these characters being companions of the Doctor? Okay. So okay, go on. Okay, so first one. Frobisher, a penguin. One of my favourite characters, without yeah. a shadow of a doubt. Yes, he was in the comics and in one big finish. There you go. See, I'm sorry. I think my choices are probably uh, too easy for you now. So yeah, a shapeshifting penguin who got sickness and got stuck in the form of a penguin. So yeah, in the comics and audio. So he's with the sickness and Captain John Picard. There was a Doctor Who crossover comic with the with Matt Smith's Doctor yes. and the next gen. So it's whether or not you're counting that as a companion or not. So I know that they have met each other in the comics. I'll give you it. It's not, I, I put him not as a companion, but yes, assimilation, which is the Borg and the Cybermen and the 11th Doctor, Amy and Rory, with the cast of Next Gen. It is a terrible comic. <laughs> well, I'm about to read it. We're, we're, we're going to discuss it on, because I, I do a Star Trek, I do a Star Trek The Next Generation podcast uh, on another network called Beyond Far Points. And my co host, Jeff, has got he managed to locate the comics, so we're going to do something where we did we, we discuss it on there. And we're also going to discuss it on the Tireless crew, so it's, it should be it should be a fun listen because yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing. It sounds both brilliant and terrible at the same time, so I'm looking forward to uh, reading those. Do you want me to give you my opinion, or do you want no spoilers? I, I, I'll come back to you when I've listened <laughs> when I've read it. Okay, yeah. okay. I, I I think you're going to get all these now. Um, Abraham Lincoln. I don't think he was. I know Mary Shelley was, but I don't think Abraham Lincoln was. Mary Shelley was. Which doctor was Mary Shelley? It was a big Finnish one that I haven't... I want to say the eighth. You're right. Yeah, eighth doctor, yes. Now, Abraham Lincoln, he appeared in The Chase, but it wasn't actually it. Um, Chameleon, shape-shifting robot. Chameleon was the robot. She was um, very briefly a companion to the fifth doctor. That's right, yeah. He first appeared as King John in the 13th century England. That's right. Sharon Osborne. I... Don't know. Um, I am going to say yes because it's so fucking ludicrous. Oh, I, lo- I wish it was. No, but she was in the uh, Son of Drums. And then, see, I, I had Susan, the Grand Doctor, Doctor. You're going to know that anyway. So I didn't realize how a fan you are. So I'm not going to ask that question. Yeah. Um, Kevin Grimlock, Cyborg T Rex. That sounds like something they would do in the comics, but I've not heard of him. So I'm going to say no. Yes, he was. He was a, a cyborg T-Rex that tried with the Doctor Amy and Rory. There you go. I know there was a cat for quite a long time yeah. in Big Finish as well, wasn't there? Yeah. I always thought the Doctor should have a cat, and I was delighted when they brought a cat yeah. in Big Finish. I, I, I think Frobisher in the main show, though, is I think we, we have to see at some point, surely. So, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure they could do a cyborg T-Rex, but yeah, if you can do a, a talking penguin, that, that might be quite fun. <laughs> okay, um, second one then. A couple of years ago, the Radio Times ran a poll of the scariest monsters of all time. How many can you guess? And do you know what came number one? 
I would guess the Daleks was number one. That's almost too obvious, though. Um, if it's not the Daleks, it'll be the Weeping Angels. It was Weeping Angels. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, there you go. Um, so the top 10 scariest Doctor Who baddies. Yes. So we've got Weeping Angels, we've got Daleks. Cyberman is another obvious yeah. one. Purely from personal experience, I'm going to say the Candyman. He scared the shit out of me. That'd be great. Yeah. No, he's not on there, but I think yeah, he's uh, he not? pretty, pretty quick. Could be creepy. Evil Bertie Bassett. Um, hmm. Are they all? So it's a mix of modern and classic. Right? Well, it feels very modern driven to me, even though they do talk about some classics. Hmm. So I'm going to. The top 10. This is hard. Um, are you giving me like a certain number I need to get? Like I did. Let, let's let's get there. five. Yeah. So you've got Daleks and Weeping Angels. I'll give you that. Bertie Bassey isn't on there. Candyman. He's not, but now I know it's more modern focused. And I would guess Cyberman. Yes, That's yeah, I got Cyberman. Yeah, as well. Not the Absorber off. Not the um, the Jadoon or the um, what were the fat ones that farted? Slovene. Um, Slovene, not them. Um, I think the Macra are too obscure. I'm just going through. I'm I'm trying to go through all the baddies kind of chronologically that we've encountered. Um. That's, I reckon the master's got to be in there. See, I, I would, I would have put that, but he's not on there. But I, I agree that the master, mm. when, when, when he's scary, he's, he's very scary. Particularly, again, again, recommendation: Derek Jacobi's master. Oh yes, but I, God, I'll never forget the uh, shiver down my spine when mm. uh, Derek Jacobi said, "I am the master." I'll never forget that. I just had another shiver down my spine talking about <laughs> it because um, it's Derek fucking Jacobi. I'm actually struggling on this. Zygons, maybe, because they're really ugly. Yeah, the Zygons are on there. Go on, I've actually struggled with Right, this. so we've got number 10 the Beast. Then they kind of cheat you Mondasi and Cybermen, which I think are creepier than Cybermen, and then Cybermen. I think the Mondasi and Cybermen, particularly in, when they brought back for Capaldi, is, is creepy. The Silence. Yeah. You forgot about those. <laughs> fucking Silence, of course. Love that. Um, the Flood yeah. from Waters of Mars. Right, okay. Vash Nevada. Okay. Though my ultra yeah. has been Vashta Barbara, which I think is funnier. Uh, Vashta Barbara, um, Gas Mart Zombies. Are you my mummy? That was that was they creepy, were yeah. amazing. Uh, and right. the Midnight Creature. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then Daleks and Weeping Angels. So yeah, very yeah. The, I, I think there some scary ones from the original area as well. Okay. Last question then. Obviously, a lot of the Doctor episodes were junked in the seventies, the black and white stuff. Some have been um, reanimated, but. Actual episode with the actual footage. How many episodes are lost currently of Dot Two? I don't think it's that many anymore. In my head, it's about thirteen or fourteen. It's ninety-seven. There's still quite a lot. Good grief! It's, I think it's because they've animated a lot of Doctor Who. So you think, oh, we can, we can. They've got a lot of audio tracks, so we can watch a lot of Dot Two now. But we can't actually see it as it originally was because they've lost the episode. So it's still ninety-seven. That's insane. Yeah. You think about how many modern series that is. Yeah. That's what, seven modern series, yeah. roughly? Well, apparently there were 253 episodes produced between 63 and 69, so that's the black and white era. And so of those, mm. the only 97 are missing, is proportionally, is not too bad these days. But yeah, it's uh, still a lot of episodes. So. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's my questions. I, I, I did have how many generations have there been on screen, but I thought that's too easy for you. You obviously you know your stuff. Let me think. So it's 14 minus 1. No, actually, we saw Paul McGann's regeneration in the end, didn't we? We did, yeah. 14. 14 Doctor reg- regenerations. Yes, because you've also had the uh, Metacrisis Doctor, which kind of counts as regeneration now because they used it as one of his lives, which I thought didn't really work, but they did it anyway. Cool. That, that's my questions. <laughs> yeah, I think you... Uh, I think you uh, I think there's a bigger Doctor fan as I am, so <laughs> maybe I need to ask. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> I think you've probably consumed a lot more Doctor Who. I have consumed a lot of Doctor Who these days, yeah. And really a lot of Doctor Who now as well. But that was lots of fun. Do you think my question levels were fair? I think they were fair. I felt a little bit ashamed, and Ben will look at me with disgust when I, when I tell, tell him <laughs> the questions. <laughs> Yeah, definitely ask Ben them and see if he gets yeah. them all. And I have to give Ben the credit for the uh, BBC police lawsuit one as well. He, he told me that, that uh, one, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant.
Well, Baz, it's been lots and lots of fun. I knew it would be. It's a conversation about Doctor Who. Where can people find you on the internet? So you can find me on Twitter at Baz Grind, where I post everything I do, everything I write, and everything I talk about and podcast on. As I said, I've got several geek podcasts. So there's Beyond Farpoint, a Starship Exploration podcast over at Hallsuite Media. And then I've got the Tardis Crew, obviously, the Doctor Who podcast on We Made This, a Dream Game Form, a brand new Battle of Five podcast on We Made This, and One Rules Them All, a Lord of the Rings podcast as well, which is a bit of a sporadic affair, and then various other things. You're a geek polymath by the sound Oh, of absolutely, it. yeah. And the other thing I've really talked about in, in depth, basically, is I, I'll quickly publicise these. So I've written for several Doctor Who-related books. So Candy Jar Books who are based a publishing company based in Cardiff, have the rights to characters from the classic era. So they have the Brigadier and now Unit as well. So we're talking the characters from like the Web of Fear and Invasion, a lot of the John, some, of the, some of the John Purpose stuff. So like Benton, for example, the Brigadier and Travers um, have all appeared in these. So I have written, read two short stories published um, and a novel published uh, called Forward to the Past. And I've got another novel another short story out this year, plus some more stuff I'm working on. So I'm really enjoying working with that. So my novel was Forward to the Past. And my latest story is, it's in a book called Operation Wildcat and Other Short Stories. It's a set of sto- short stories set during the unit era of Doctor Who. And my story, How to Negotiate with Sentient Tree in Shoreditch, is a Benton and a <laughs> Brigadier story. So you can find that all at Candy Jar Books. Amazing. Well, Baz... It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for being part of Geek Polymath. Thank you. It's been been a real pleasure to talk about it. And thank you for listening to Geek Polymath. And until next month, you just enjoy what the fuck you like. Geek Polymath is a podcast brought to you by the We Make This Podcast Network. You can follow the show on Twitter at Geek Polymath. The show's creator and host is me, Mark Adams. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at MarkAdamsHC. The show's logo was created by Carl Bryan and the theme tune was composed and performed by Colin Jackson Brown. Thank you for listening to Geek Polymath. Elsewhere on We Made This. A giddy carousel of pop. By 1989, I'd actually landed a job working at a fashion PR agency called Lynn Frank's PR. This particular issue is memorable to me because it was our first smash its cover for our client, uh, Nana Cherry. They never told you if you, you'd get a cover or not. There'd all be this, this kind of cat and mouse. Well, you know, we'll look at it as a great feature and we'll have to have our own shoot and we'll have to do this. Da, 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 da. And then there's quite a long period of negotiation and you never really knew if you got the cover until it came out. And I remember, you know, when you go down and see it on the newsstand it was a fantastic feeling just felt like you know this is my sort of goal in extra time to win the <laughs> chucky vision a chucky podcast the introduction the editorial if you will was written by david campetti and it shows real love and isn't shy about having a dig at cheap ass lazy film <laughs> adaptations yeah, Capetti is an interesting one as the, the, the co-founder of Innovation and also the editor. Yeah, a lot of his editorials are hawking other merch, hawking, you know, the different books and stuff they're putting out. But it never felt too corporate. He, he has a passion in his voice that he very much is enthusiastic and enjoys that they're getting to adapt these franchises. It does seem like he's definitely acquired Chucky because he's a fan. The theme this month was an Anne Rule book, so true crime, but not The Stranger Beside Me, which is her big book that broke her, you know, broke the world of true crime fiction, not fiction, non-fiction. True crime fiction, I just said, that's not a sentence. Yeah. He fell in love. Oh.
he's so in love, but still not in love enough to stop using sex workers. Yeah. But in love enough to not murder them. So Okay. He's a romantic, is what I'm saying. Yeah, what a man. What a dreamy man. Um, but his actual name was Robert Knickerbocker. Wow. Which is like the best surname ever. Do you think maybe she thought no one's going to believe this is a real name? Well, yeah, that could have been it. If I'm wrong, please don't correct me. I don't want to know. I'll understand, <laughs> right? Thank you. Check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This podcast network.